All right. Kind of a follow-up to those announcements. I love how that we celebrate the risen Jewish Savior Jesus with pork. (laughs) How did that become our Easter holiday meat of choice? Think about it. Number two. If this guy can dress up as an Easter bunny and go out into our community and celebrate our kids with an Easter hunt, you can pass out those cards to somebody you know. All right? So <laughs> let's do that. Let's do that. My name is Tim Bycroft. I'm one of the pastors here at uh, the Point Church. We're glad that you guys are here with us as we're in this series entitled Red Letter Day. And <coughs> excuse me, we're just talking about some of the, the words that Jesus spoke. We're actually talking about the words that Jesus spoke while he was hanging on the cross. And you have to think that when somebody is dying on a cross, um, they're saying their last words, those are probably some pretty important words for us to lean into, right? So we've been, we're going to be looking at that from now until Easter. So I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, let me start off by asking a question. How many of you have had someone do something to you that for all practical purposes was just completely and totally unforgivable. Anybody? Somebody done something to you, like, you you know, (laughs) you go through the drive-thru and you don't check your bag until you get home and you look in the bag of the fast food order that you got and it's completely wrong. I don't know about you, that's that's unforgivable. (laughs) How many of you on your way to church today had somebody who was not driving the speed limit in front of you? Unforgivable. Right? You know these things. You know these things. Maybe I should have asked the question today, how many of you have done something to somebody else that's unforgivable? Oh, hey, oh, hey, let's not be raising hands or looking at the person sitting next to you. But hey, there's things, right? We know there's things. And, and those were kind of some funny stuff up front, but we know that there's some stuff that, man, somebody did something unthinkable to you. Maybe somebody did something unthinkable to your child. They did something terrible to your spouse. Maybe they demoralized a friend of yours. And, and, and I'm probably going to guess that when I asked that question a minute ago, has someone done something unforgivable to you? You probably all had a face flash before your eyes, didn't you? Don't answer that. Okay. We're looking at the last words of Jesus while he's hanging on the cross and we have to think these are pretty important words and what happened leading up to that is, you know, Jesus, he's been beaten. We know this. We, he's been spit upon. He's been humiliated. He's been punched in the face. It says that he was beaten with rods and with fists and with rings to the point where he was unrecognizable as a human being. It says that he was beaten with a, <laughs> with, with a thing. It's, it's, it's 39 times with what's called a cat of nine tails. Kind of interesting that they use a cat as an instrument of torture. But this was a whip that had nine pieces of leather and wrapped or braided into the leather were, leather were strips of like a, pieces of shard of bone or, or, or pottery, sometimes rocks, whatever, sharpened so that when, when they whipped it across his back, it would stick and then they would pull the flesh off with it. 39 times he was beaten with that. The emotional damage that was done, can you imagine being forced to carry your own cross to where you're going to be hung on it? When he's hung on this cross, where it's called the skull, where they made him go and be hung on the cross. You know, it, we, we do Jesus the favor in paintings and artist's work to put a loincloth on him. But most likely he was hanging there completely naked, humiliated. The emotional toll that this had to take on sight of him, we know that Jesus... It was a mock trial. Jesus was put through a mock trial. And, and so he, he, there was no reason, as a matter of fact, I believe him to be the sin, only sin-free person to ever walk this earth is hanging on a cross between two criminals. And as Jesus is hanging there, dying, knowing these are his last breaths, suffering tremendously, he looks out and who's there? 
how the Roman soldiers that just beat him and put nails through his hands and nails through his feet. And he looks out and he sees the Pharisees and the scribes who, who really are the ones who perpetrated all this to take place to get him to the point where he's hanging on this cross, dying, brutally dying. He looks out and he sees this crowd of people who were screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus is hanging there in agony. And he speaks the most just amazing, mind-blowing. Actually, they're, they're words of prayer as he's looking out on these people. And he says these words to his father. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when I hear those words, I don't know about you. I'm ruined. I'm crushed. When I consider everything that Jesus went through to that point, and he cries out to his father, Father, forgive them. Man, I'm ruined. Because I don't know about you, but if I was hanging on that cross, I might be saying some other things. <laughs> My prayer might be, God, get them. Send your legions to just wipe them out. Take care of this myth. Bring me down off this cross. I don't deserve this. I want justice. Do to them what they've done to me. If nothing else, Lord, give them herpes and hemorrhoids. And walk around with a cold sore and a limp. We got to take that part out. My mom's going to release this and that. And then I'm going to get email. But Jesus didn't. Jesus didn't do what you and I would probably do. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. And so let's be honest. I'm going to go back to that question I had. I'm going to guess that all of us to some degree or another, have had people in our lives who have done things to us that we would label as unforgivable, unforgivable, right? We want vengeance. Again, you can probably see the face that you want to get vengeance with today. Vengeance, let's just, let's just be honest. The vengeance is our natural default as human beings. As a matter of fact, that's just what we do. As a matter of fact, some people would consider it biblical. And, and let's be honest, before Christ, the response was, you owe me and justice is mine. Right? Because I'm going to guess that most of us have heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, haven't we? How many of you have even said that? Well, don't raise your hand. All right? You've heard it said. And that's what the law said. If, if, if you hurt me, then I get to hurt you back in the same way. So often today we do the same thing. Somebody hurts us and man, we get ticked off. And what do we want immediately? We want that person to know that you ticked me off. I'm offended and I'm coming after you. And you owe me. Okay? We, we want to get even. We were innocent. We didn't do anything. And we want to make sure that they pay for what they've done. As a matter of fact, I don't know about you, but usually when I'm offended and someone ticks me off, I don't want them to just get back. I want to get ahead. My wife will tell you, don't do practical jokes with Tim Bycroft. Because he doesn't pay back. He gets ahead. I don't play fair. I don't intend to play fair. Okay. I want to get ahead. We must be honest. Many times we don't want to repay an offense. We want to get ahead tenfold. But that was pre-Christ. What does it look like after Christ's response? The after Christ response is this. God forgave me, so now I forgive you. That's the after Christ response. And it's not easy, Right? Jesus taught this during his ministry while he was here in Matthew chapter 6. Most of us have probably prayed that. We probably have. You, you've heard of the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, right? It's in there. Jesus said, pray like this. 
And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. I mean, Jesus taught this over and over and over. Jesus Jesus did what he often does, and he always takes stuff to the next level. Jesus would take the law, and then he would take it to the next level. And he'd say, it's not an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. It's forgive as God has forgiven you. And I'm going to guess that all of us know our offenses to God, and we want God to forgive us completely, don't we? Therefore, if God is going to give, uh, forgive us completely, and entirely, how are we supposed to get, forgive others? Whoa. That's huge. And it's not easy. You see, forgiveness has two categories. Number one, most of us want this, somewhat demand that we're forgiven. And the second part is we forgive others. We receive it and we also give it. Forgiveness. Actually, forgiveness is the central focus of the cross. As Jesus offered these words, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. He's teaching us. He was teaching his disciples what our response to offenses are. They weren't just words. They were setting the stage for how we are to live our lives. In light of what Jesus did on the cross, in light of the forgiveness that we've received, we also get to give. So forgiveness, I want you to hear me on this. Forgiveness is the central focus of the cross. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a, a story. Actually, it's Jesus' story. It's a parable of a servant, okay? It's found in Matthew chapter 18. And, and I want you to follow along with this. Let me give you a little of the context of what's going on. So if you were here last week, if you, if you paid attention to what I said last week, I said all of us need a friend like Peter. Why? Because Peter's always gonna make you look smarter. I think that's why keep, people keep me around, okay? Because <laughs> I'm going to make you look, I'm going to look a lot like Peter many times. But Peter shoots his mouth off often. Peter sometimes gets his lips in front of his brain, okay? And he says things. And, and I think this is one of those times where Peter was like, hey, I'm going to go to Jesus. I got, a, I got a good one for Jesus. I'm going to get him with this one. He looks at his disciples and says, watch this, hold my wine. And he goes up to Jesus and he says this. He's like, hey, Jesus. So I went, I went and got this camel the other day at the camel store. And uh, I brought it home. I was really proud of this camel. I was about to show the family and the leg falls off. <laughs> Dud camel. Can't believe that guy sold me that camel. I'm ticked off. However, Jesus, I forgave that guy. As a matter of fact, it's come up into my mind like six or seven times and I've forgiven him like seven times, Jesus. So Jesus, how many times am I for, supposed to forgive somebody? Like seven times? And Jesus looks at Peter and goes, Peter, 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 Peter. Actually, Peter, you're supposed to forgive somebody 70 times seven. Peter's like, wait a minute, I gotta I got do the math. So I'm gonna carry the four. Um, so Peter's trying to figure out the math on this. How many times do I actually have to forgive somebody? 70 times seven, that's a lot, okay? And Jesus, he just keeps rolling. He says, let me tell you a story. Let me, let me tell you a parable how, how you're going to understand how to forgive someone. And he starts in, in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 23. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king. Now, who's the king in this story? You need to understand this first. The king of the story is God, right? That's who, that's who the king of this story is. Who decided to bring his accounts up to date with his servants. Okay, who are the servants? We are. Who had borrowed money from him? Now, in the process, one of the debtors, one of the servants, was brought up who owed him millions of dollars. Okay? Millions, huge debt, massive amount of debt. Verse 25. This servant who owed the, the king, the master, a tremendous amount of money, he could not pay. Underline that. So his master ordered him to be sold along with his wife and his children and everything he owned to pay the debt. Now, listen to the gravity of that, right? Think of the gravity of this. You owe somebody some money, and back in this time, if you owed somebody money, they could have you put in jail. They could sell you into slavery to pay off your debt. I mean, this is tremendous. This is huge, right? What if that was happening today? Wowza. 
If I wasn't a pastor, I'd probably say something like this. There'd be a lot of congressmen doing their work from jail. I'm not a, I'm not a pastor. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> all right, verse 26. But all the men fell, but the man fell down before his master and begged him. Can you sense the emotion? <laughs> this guy knows that he's about to be sold into slavery. That's not a good thing. That's not a cool thing. Not only that, but his wife and his kids are going to be sold into slavery too. They may be separated. I don't know. But it's not a good thing. But you can see the desperation in this man. It says that he actually literally got down on his knees and he begged the king, King, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. At this, the king, the master, was filled with pity, with mercy for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. Wow. That's an amazing forgiveness, right? That's what Jesus is talking about. This is amazing forgiveness. There's a beautiful story here of the servant being released from his master's debt. This is a story of God releasing us, you and me, from our debt of sin. This is amazing, isn't it? This is awesome. Because you and I know that we have a debt that we cannot pay. God, right? It's, it's called sin. This is our debt. But there's a couple things that we learn from this. There's two lessons that I think we can glean from this on how do we then forgive? Here's the first lesson. Lesson number one is that we have to understand that the debtor can't always repay. The debtor can't always repay. I mean, back in verse 24, it says in the process, the debtor brought, uh, who owed him millions of dollars. And some would say, you know, maybe putting billions of dollars on that or trillions of dollars. Anyway, it's a tremendous amount of debt that most of us don't have. And we couldn't look at and go, wow, I could pay that off in a lifetime. And we couldn't. So verse 25, he couldn't pay. And so I want you to understand that there are times in our lives where somebody offends you, somebody does something to you. Somebody hurts you, somebody hurts your spouse, somebody hurts your kids, somebody hurts your friend, and they can't repay you. It's impossible. Somebody can't repay their debt. I'm not talking about a mortgage type of debt. I'm not talking about the five easy payments because you, you overspent on Amazon. You know, you did that impulse buying, right? And now you've got debt beyond what you can pay. Nobody ever does impulse buying in here, right? Liars, y'all can take communion twice today if need be, because we all do that, all right? <laughs> finger pointing, no finger pointing. <laughs> we know that there are things that people can't repay, right? We know that there are things that are done to us. People offend us to a point where they can't repay. You share something in confidence with somebody, and then they take that, and they go and share it with somebody else. And I will tell you, how many of you have been offended by somebody on this stupid social media that has taken the world by storm? Because you shared something or somebody said something on social media that hurt you deeply. And guess what? They can go take it off, but it was already out there. It's, it's, maybe you're in a marriage relationship and your husband and your wife and all of a sudden, you said something and they said something back and you said words that you regret and they said words that they regret. And let's be honest, you can't turn back the clock. You can't take those words back that have already been said. It's like, if you ever taken a tube of toothpaste and just <laughs> squirt it all out, trying to get those, that toothpaste back in there, it's like an impossible task. That's words, man. That's words that come out. And there, there's nothing you can do. Those words are out there. Or maybe somebody did something to your child. Nobody else knows about. A trusted friend, a trusted relationship. Abuse comes in many forms. I know that. No amount of retribution could ever repay many times what is done to a child. And I'm going to guess there's many of you in here that have gone through that. Maybe it happened years ago. That person is long gone. Maybe that person isn't even on this earth anymore. There's no way that they could repay. 
the hurt that was caused. And I'm telling you something, we need to figure this out. We need to understand that we can't always expect someone else to repay the debt, to fix it. Can't rewind the clock, can't take back the words. The actions cannot be undone. It's out there, it's done, it happened. And the truth is, we're that debtor. We're that debtor. We've done things. We've said things. And those things cannot be undone. We can't repay our sins against God. Did you hear me on that? I need you to hear me on that. Some of you are working really hard to undo the things that you've done towards God and sin, and you can't. It's done. It's done. Here's the second truth. The offended, the offended can always show mercy. Verse 27, the master was filled with much pity, with much mercy, and he released him, the, this guy who owed a ton of debt, he released him and forgave his debt, okay? We have to learn to show mercy to other people. We have to learn to be graceful people. We have to learn to be loving people to the point where we're willing to forgive. Oftentimes, okay, let's talk about this one for a second. This is kind of a side note, but we're going to talk about it. Do you realize that sometimes the people that you need to forgive don't even know they offended you? I get this a lot, actually. So on Sunday mornings, <clears throat> Sunday mornings, I get tunnel vision sometimes because I got tasks to do and I got things that happening around me. And, and sometimes I'm walking through the hallway, sometimes I'm walking through the foyer, wherever, and I can li literally just walk by a person. And, and it's not like I didn't really know them, but I've got tunnel vision because I got a task to do and I didn't stop and say hi. And, and I've actually had people get really upset with me. I mean, like mad, because I didn't stop and say hi, okay? And I get that. I should. That's something I should do. It's a polite thing to do. However, I didn't even know that they were mad at me. I didn't find out till weeks, months later that they were mad at me. And you know how much that hurt me? Zero. Your anger towards me doesn't hurt me. Now, I, I, I apologize and I'm sorry that you were hurt by my lack of actions towards you. It wasn't my intent and I would gladly say hi to anybody. But because you were hurt for maybe weeks or months and all of a sudden you're just like, I didn't even know it. And it didn't hurt me at all. But you were just bitter. Um, now, I also have this. I know that I have a very dry sense of humor and, and my, my native tongue is sarcasm. And so much so that one of my uh, staff members made this sign for me for staff meetings <laughs> that I have to hold up occasionally because I will say things that they had no idea. I was just being sarcastic and they took it for truth. And so finally they made a sign that says, you got to hold this up when you're being sarcastic because we don't know. And I've hurt people's feelings. Like, really hurt people's feelings when I thought it was funny on the inside. I guess I should have been laughing on the outside. Right? And, and, and here's the thing. We can unintentionally hurt someone, and the truth of the matter is, I've done it, and I didn't even know. And you're hurt, and you're miserable, and you can't sleep at night. And the truth of the matter is, I was sleeping like a baby. Because I didn't know. It didn't hurt me. Okay, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, and I, and I don't intentionally do it, right? And, and we need to apologize when we have done it, but sometimes we just need to forgive another person because, hey, they didn't intentionally do something. Or maybe, if you're a lady, you didn't get invited to the baby shower. And oh my gosh, all, all of a sudden on Instagram, Facebook, there's pictures of the baby shower. and pff, I didn't get invited. They got invited, but I didn't get invited. Or you didn't get the Christmas card this year from the family or, or whatever. And you're all twisted up and, and, and picking a fence, right? You can pick an offense. And, 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 and sometimes we just need to learn to forgive the other person. Unless it's when you're driving. And when it's posted 55, you drive 55. If you're driving 45 and I'm behind you. All right, so here's what I do. You're driving 45 and a 55 mile an hour speed limit. Number one, I'm not even sure that 
that's not a sin somehow, okay? You should be driving the speed limit. And so I usually, here, here's, here's what has happened in my past. I have gotten on the, and, I, and my wife, my heavenly sandpaper sitting next to me, and she's going, Tim, knock it off. Because what I'll do is I'll get right up on their bumper, because if I start, you know, getting right on their bumper, obviously that's going to make them drive faster. And I was doing this not long ago, and I'm just right on this person's bumper. I'm trying to get home. They're driving 45 and a 55, and I'm just like, yeah, get out of the way. I'm trying to get around them. There's no way to get around them. I'm right. I'm start. I literally, I start turning my lights on and off. All right, get out of my way. I'm put. I'm like pushing them. I'm thinking the air between us is going to make their car go faster. I don't know. And so I'm bumping and bumping. Well, just go, come, come on, come on. And so all of a sudden the two lane turns in the four lane and I'm like, and I'm, and you know, the look, right? You've got the look on your face, getting ready to give it to them because somehow you think your face and is going to hurt them in their car. Right? So I get the face ready. I get up alongside of this and it's like this 90 year old lady who's looking through the steering wheel Two and ten, you know, she's she's freaking out as it is, let alone this jerk on her bumper. And and, and I get up alongside her and I give her the oh. I'm going to hell. Straight to hell, do not pass go. Right? And all of a sudden I'm just like, oh my gosh, this grandma's probably going to her grandson's basketball game or something, you know. And she's just trying to get there to be nice, grandma. And, Then I have to repent and I have to say sorry. And sometimes we just need to forgive people because they don't even know they're offending us, right? Sometimes they just don't even know. So we talked about the origin of this story of the servant. And I gave you the first part. Let's look at the second half of this story. So this, uh, this servant, he's been forgiven a lot, right? I mean, can you imagine this servant Millions, trillions, whatever, whatever kind of label on it, something that you could never pay off in your lifetime has just now for, been forgiven. This guy, he's walking out of the palace. He's like high-fiving his buddies. He's like, no more car payments, no more house payment. No, I mean, free and clear. I, I feel so free right now. I'm out of debt. Can you imagine a life? I, I would love to get to a point where I was completely out of debt. Anybody with me? I mean, that would just be freedom, right? So he's free. So he's walking out of the palace. The king has just forgiven him his debt. He's on cloud nine and he sees this guy walking towards them that owes him a hundred bucks. And he remembers, oh, this guy owes me a hundred bucks. So he goes up, literally, this is what the Bible says. He starts shaking the guy. He starts choking the guy saying, give me my money. And the guy says, I can't, I, I can't pay you. I don't have it. And he has the guy thrown in prison. And he says, torture this guy until he gives me my money. Well, the king hears about this. And he says, go get him. So they go and get the servant that, that owed the king a tremendous amount of money that, that the king had forgiven, okay? He had heard about what he had done to this other guy. And in verse 32, he calls him before him and he says this to that servant. The king says, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison and tortured uh, until he paid his entire debt. Who is saying these words? Jesus. About who? Us and God. Verse 35. And this is what your heavenly father will do to you if, circle that, highlight it, underline it, If you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. And some of you would be sitting here today going, wow, if that's your God, I want nothing to do with him. That seems pretty harsh. But can I tell you something? I think God uses something to get our attention in this. I think it is harsh words because God realizes something. And that is this. God knows that unforgiveness puts you in the prison. I've heard it said like this. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison expecting the other person to die. 
Because unforgiveness locks you in prison. And my question to you is, how many of us today are are locked in prison of unforgiveness? Do you have unforgiveness in your heart? You've, You've had it so long in your heart towards someone and, and, and you just learn to just live with it, some bitterness, some anger, some resentment, some unforgiveness. And we always think, you know, forgiveness, if, you know, if, if, but if I forgive this person, I'm benefiting them. Can I tell you something? Forgiveness doesn't necessarily benefit the other person, but it always benefits you. Amen. So forgiveness unlocks the door to your prison I think God wants us to escape that prison. He desperately wants us to escape that prison. And so do we, what do we do? Because some of you are here today and you're hearing these words and you're like, yeah, that's great for you, preacher boy, in your perfect little preacher circle and Christian bubble that you live in. Everything's nicey-nicey for you. And, but you have no idea what I've been through, Tim. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know what I've been through. Tim, you don't realize that when my dad came home drunk and he beat my mom and he was done with her, he started it on us. And we tried to hide, but he found us too often. Tim, you don't know. You don't realize. You don't realize that I'm married for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer. And one day, my spouse up has an affair and is gone. Tim, you don't realize what they said to me. The coach, the teacher, the parent, the aunt, the uncle poured into me continuously how worthless I was. I had someone like that one time. I can, I can tell you the resentment that I still have in there that's, that's hard to get rid of. I, there was many things that this person said to me, but one that I've hung on to, he says, you know what? Put your hand into a bucket of water and pull it out, and the hole that is left is how much you will be missed on this earth. And we hold on to those things. And we can easily hold on to that. And how do you forgive that person? How do you forgive that person? And I will tell you, it's not easy. But I looked at Jesus and what he was going through on that cross, if you can put yourself into his position, and I will tell you that Jesus freely gave up his deity and was fully man when he was hanging on that cross. And he carried every pain and every sin imaginable and he's dying and he carried every evil. And Jesus did that because his love for you and for me and he demonstrated God's love is greater than any offense that we will go through. Jesus' love is greater than any offense that you will face or have faced. So we forgive. Because too often we're locked in that prison of unforgiveness. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter six, for if, and I want you to underline those words, if you forgive, If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men of their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. And this is what I want you to hear me on, okay? When I read that, and there's many other words or many other passages of scripture that I could glean this from, is that you have to understand, some of you will sit here today and go, I can't possibly forgive. But forgiveness is a choice. You have the choice to forgive. And so often in life, we, we try to forget. And I will tell you, can I just tell you? You can't forget. 
So often in life, what we try to do is we're just going to manage this. Can I tell you something? You can't manage unforgiveness. And many times what we try to do is we try to push the offense so far away that we just, we're, just, we're just walking away from it. And can I tell you something? You can't run far enough away from the offense that some people have done to you. Because I will tell you, there are offenses that have happened to me and there's offenses that have happened to you that literally are unforgivable. There's things that have happened to you that are unforgivable from a human standpoint. So how do you forgive the unforgivable? How do you love the unlovable? How do you accept the unacceptable? I will tell you how. It's through prayer. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. It's no longer you forgiving that person. It's God working through you to forgive that person. Because left to my own ambition, I can't forgive you. Leaning into the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, that's what we're talking about. God will help us to forgive. I mean, look at Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. Where did he start? He started with prayer, right? He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I believe that's the first step in, in talking about forgiveness. It's praying. It's inviting Jesus to be part of your life, the king of the universe, into your hearts to do something that you cannot do on your own. God, come into my life. Turn my heart around. You can forgive and you can let go and you can be freed from the prison, but it starts with a choice of you saying, God, help me to do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to some of you because you're still sitting here and you still don't believe me in this. <laughs> and maybe your first prayer this morning is, God, help me to want to forgive. Because you've lived so long with this ideology that you deserve to be mad at them, to be angry, to be upset. You've justified your anger and your desire for justice. And we deserve to be offended and angry and unforgiven. So maybe the prayer is, God, help me to change my attitude towards this person. Because right now, I don't want to forgive them. They don't deserve my forgiveness. So God, help me to want to forgive. And you say it's still impossible. I could never forgive that person. What's impossible for man is always possible for God. God can do far more than we can even imagine in our lives. As we make those steps towards forgiveness through prayer, God can change your life by his love, his grace, his spirit, because I want you to hear me on this. Your first initial prayer may not change that other person at all. But prayer, can I hear, hear me on this? Lean in on this one. That's what you're paying me the big money for. <laughs> prayer always changes you. Amen. Always. The reason this is such an important thing, an important subject, is forgiveness holds us in a prison and we're the ones suffering. And God wants to set you free. And I believe that God wants to set many of you free today. You're not here by mistake. There's not a person here that's here by mistake today. God brought you here. God wants to set you free today. So as I conclude, as I'm wrapping up, as the band comes out, why is this such a big deal? It's a big deal. Because we've all created debt. We've all created a debt that we cannot pay, right? We know this. We've created a debt with God that we cannot pay, and that debt is simply called sin. And just like the servant, right? The servant in our story, no amount, there is no way that you can pay back this debt. There's just, there's just no way. The, the amount of sin that we've done that... that that we would need to pay back. There's no way that we can do that. However, God, out of his unconditional love for you, his amazing grace for you, his extravagant mercy paid that debt for you. He is that, that, he is that king in the story who says, you owe a tremendous debt that you cannot pay. Let me forgive it for you. But it wasn't done without a cost. It cost Jesus his life. Jesus died and paid the debt that we could not owe. 
that he did not owe that we could not pay. So I'm going to do something a little different today. If you're visiting with us, we're going to do something weird, but welcome to the point, church, we are weird. And I'm the chief weirdo. And I'm okay with that. (laughs) Thank you. She knows. This is what I want to do. When I read this story of the servant and the king, when when the king comes to him and, and tries to collect the debt, the servant, what did he do? He postured himself in a way of submission to the king. And I wonder how many of us have actually done that. And maybe you have, but maybe it's been a while. And so right where you're at today, this is what I want to do. Maybe, maybe it's just leaning forward into the chair that you're in front of you. But this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to close this way. I would like for everyone to posture yourself before the king. Because he is the one who forgives a debt that we could not pay. And so maybe today, as as you posture yourself, it looks something like this. Follow my lead. Get on your knees. It's okay. Nobody's going to make fun of you. And if you can't get on your knees, if you can't get on your knees, just lean on the chair in front of you. That's okay. I get it. Some of you are just like, I got old knees. That's okay. Now what I'd like for you to do is posture yourself before God in a position of surrender. Just bow your head. Close your eyes. Some of you are saying today, before God, you're saying, Tim, I I know what I have done. And I wouldn't forgive myself. How can a God forgive me, a holy God? And as you come before God, I want you to know, I, I, I want you to hear God whisper this in your ear. I know you. I know you because I've been with you. I've been calling to you. And God forgives us. No matter how far away we've gone, no matter how far away we've traveled, no sin is too great for him to forgive. And maybe your prayer today is this, God, forgive me. God, I don't deserve it, but none of us do. But I ask today that you would forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. That, that, that you would forgive me of the things that I have done. God, that you would just settle this and forgive me. God, pour out your love. Help me to recognize your presence and your peace and your power and your, your grace, and your, your mercy, and your forgiveness. God, I've never experienced that before. Or if I did, it's been a long time ago. And I've been having some unsettled business with you for a long time. So God, I I pray that as your word says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be forgiven. God, hear the hearts of the people here today. And God, as we continue to pray, Lord, there may be people here today that have been holding on to unforgiveness towards someone else. And They've received your forgiveness. They they understand your grace and your mercy. They understand your love. But man, there's just been some stuff that has happened in their lives where they're struggling to forgive. God, I pray right now. I'm going to guess that there's people who are here today who are watching online that have that face in front of them of the person they're struggling to forgive. So God, right now, help them to want to forgive, help them to forgive, help them to be reminded of the forgiveness that you've demonstrated to them, help them to know the strength and the power of your spirit that can help them to forgive the people that they need to forgive in order to release them from the prison, the bondage, the slavery of unforgiveness today. God, we know that you can do this. I I have faith that you're doing that right now in many people's lives. Therefore, God, we worship you. We praise you. We honor you because you are a God of mercy and grace and love and forgiveness. 
You've done all this. You've demonstrated all this through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.